This game was played in the eighth round of the World Under-18 Championship in Szeged, Hungary in 1994. I was tied for first place with two rounds to go, inches from a World Championship title. My opponent was the Vietnamese national champion, a very talented player. At this point in the game, I have a clear advantage with black. I've been mounting the pressure very effectively, and my attack will soon materialize. Really envision the tournament situation, the World Championship. Try to feel the pressure. I played h5, expanding on the king's side. My plan is to gradually push him back and work up an assault against the king. He played queen d1, queen h7. So you can see in a position like this, in which there aren't so many flurries of tactics happening everywhere, that the players do become pretty connected. We're seeing similar possibilities. He knows what my plan is. I know what his plan is. The question is who will succeed. I played queen h7 at once to I my h5 pawn in case he wants to play bishop takes f4 and queen takes h5 and also potentially to play knight g6 and h4 to try to actually win his piece. You never know, I might play knight takes g2 also and h4, making that trade and messing up his pawn structure. I have a lot of possibilities, but for the moment, I'm just going to play rook f7 and rook f8. Here he stopped all those different tactics, played bishop takes f4. Now how would you play? Here the old rule of taking towards the center wouldn't quite be correct because g takes f4 opens up my king a little much and stops my attacking possibilities. After e takes f4, my plan of g4 and later g3 or f3 or something like that will be very strong. He played e5. What would you do now? My attack is on the king's side. I don't want the center to open up. I played d5, keeping things locked down still eyeing the king side. He played d4. I mounted the pressure a little more with g4. So far from the very start, this has been an excellent game with black. He played queen d3, offering an exchange. What would you do now? Again, you can find the answer in the principles. Don't trade off pieces when you have a positional advantage or a spatial advantage. Rook f5. Continuing my plan of building up on the king side with rook f8 and blocking the queens. He played f3. He was concerned with my playing f3. What now with black? It became apparent at this point that the g file was going to be critical, not the f file. King h8, planning rook g8. A slow mounting game. He played king f2, getting off the g file. His plan now will be to bring his rook to g1 to challenge my control of it. I played rook g8, and now he tried rook h1. He didn't know it was going to open up, and I think at this point he was considering having one rook on h1, one rook on g1, putting all of his pieces into the defense of the king's side. And now after rook h1, I calculated very deeply and played g takes f3. He played g takes f3. Of course, after queen takes f3, rook f to g5 would be decisive, because I threatened both g2 and the queen as a discovered attack against the c2 square. White's in big trouble. He had to play g takes f3. Do you see what my idea was? Queen e7. Very strong move. Threatening queen h4 check. He has to stop it. h4. The key is that I had calculated he would have to play h4, and his rook would be tied down to the defense of that square, and then I knew I could take control of the g file. Rook f7. A very strong move. Next will be rook f to g7. You can feel with everything on the line the mounting pressure in this game. White is coming closer and closer to the precipice. He played rook a to g1. Black to move, what would you do? Rook f to g7. Now black's going to control the g-file because of the critical weakness on h4. Now I should mention that intrinsic in this kind of position is the principle of two weaknesses. His a3 pawn is hanging. Notice I haven't taken it, but later on, it can be very important. If I have a pawn structure like a pawn on b5 and a pawn on a4 and I win that a3 pawn, then that will be very telling in an endgame. So all of the middle game discussion evolves around the reality that in an endgame, if I win that a3 pawn, which is a principal weakness, for example, my queen on e7 hits two weaknesses on h4 and a3, and if we trade off enough material, he won't be able to defend them both. So from one perspective, I don't want to trade off because I'm attacking. From another perspective, the trades will be good for me because of his endgame weaknesses. So his position has problems on many different levels. After rook fg7, he's reached a crisis point. My threat is rook takes g1, rook takes g1, queen takes h4 check, which will win. 
If he plays rook takes g7, then I simply play queen takes g7, and he can't challenge my control of the g-file anymore. My next move is going to be queen g3 check. Big trouble. He decided to give up the pawn in a way that would give him some hope of counterplay. He played rook g5, rook takes g5, h takes g5, queen takes g5, queen f1. He gave up a pawn, so my extra pawn now is on the h-file, and his idea was that my queen would have to be careful of that because I don't want to allow rook takes h5 with check because that would give him counterplay. I'm sure you can feel the intimacy of the players in this kind of game. We're both focused for so many moves on the same questions, on the king's side, on how to exploit these little weaknesses in his game for me, and how to defend all those same weaknesses for him. The game also has the character of maintaining the tension. I'm maintaining the tension, and he's trying to survive in it. I played queen f5, he played queen d3. I was attacking the c2 pawn, just repeating moves, moving one step closer to time control on the 40th move. After queen d3, I went back to g5, he played queen f1, I played queen g3 check, he played king e2. And now I did a very deep calculation and made the decision that the rook endgame was winning for me. I played queen g2 check, a very strong move. Now if he plays queen takes g2, rook takes g2, and say king d3, then I can play simply rook g5. There's very little that white can do. I can improve with my king, penetrate on the king's side, and remember that second weakness on a3. I made the judgment that this position should be winning for black. And here came arguably the most incredible moment in my chess career. This is the world championship game. I was the American national champion. He was the Vietnamese national champion. Both of us national champions for our age group under 18 years. That's the way the world championships work. Everyone sends their national champion and the winner of the whole thing gets the world title. I'm far from home and hungry. There's spectators everywhere. People are watching on televisions. People are talking about the games. There were rafters above where the playing boards were. And the whole American contingent there was we were watching. Our coach, Pal Benko, the famous Hungarian grandmaster who lives in America for many years now, was there. And he is actually somebody who I worked with privately for quite some time. He's a wonderful man, one of the great endgame specialists in the world, and a close friend of Bobby Fischer, actually. And Benko was there coaching me in this tournament. My parents were up, actually, in the rafters as well, watching with Benko. Hundreds of people were watching the game. And it was a very high-level game, a very tense game. You can feel the pressure. I had been gradually, gradually pushing him back, the world championship hanging in the balance. And he played queen f2 here. And I went into a deep think. I had calculated the end game after queen takes g2, rook takes g2. But that was pretty much all I had calculated. I had worked out that variation because I thought that was forced. And then he played queen f2. We weren't in very big time pressure here. <laughs> the truth be told, no, we were just two strong players working on a chess position. I played queen g2 check, and he blocked it with queen f2, and I... <laughs> When I look at this now, I really can't believe that this happened. But I sat there thinking, and I went deep into a calculation. And I was working out what would happen after queen takes f2. And I was going deeper and deeper into it. And I'm sure that pretty much all of you looking at this position can see that if it's black's move, I can just take his rook. Queen takes h1. His rook is hanging. And that's it. But he missed it when he played queen f2, and I missed it. And I got so deep into this calculation of the endgame, and I was working on all these very, very hard, complex little subtleties of the rook and pawn endgame, that I didn't just resurface and look at the obvious. This is a perfect example of communal chess blindness, of the psychological connection between chess players. We both missed two national champions, missing the simple queen takes rook one square away. <laughs> it blows my mind to look at the position now. My parents told me that at this point, because I was taking so long, everyone realized in the rafters that I didn't see the queen takes rook. And my dad told me that Benko almost had a heart attack. He was um, pulling out his hair, looking at down there, hanging off the rafters, just mind-boggled that I didn't play queen takes rook. And at one point, and I didn't notice this, my opponent wasn't so clever about this one, but he got up from the board and picked up his jacket and just kind of walked away in disgust because he saw it. And I was so deeply involved in the endgame that I um, didn't snap out of it. If I had just, of course, looked at the position, I would have seen queen takes rook. But... I didn't. It's a mind-boggling thing that I didn't um, see this simple capture of a piece after I was calculating all these complex lines in this tremendously important game. So anyway, here's an example of the psychological connection between players. And I didn't see the rook, I rejected the queen endgame, and I made the earth-shattering move that sent the whole American team up in the rafters into total shock. I played queen g6, retreating. Maintaining the tension in the most absurd moment you could ever 
maintain the tension. Unbelievable. And after I played queen g6, my opponent had pretty much given up the game because he saw queen takes rook and he didn't think there was a chance I wouldn't have noticed this obvious thing. And he, he threw his coat right over his chair. Actually, it hit me, just right onto me he threw it because he was so excited he couldn't believe the game wasn't over. And uh, he was back in it. So here we were. And I didn't even know what was going on. And the truth of the matter is that I didn't even know until after the game. People told me well after I went on to win this game that I had missed queen takes h1. Now the question would have been, given the context of this course, is how I would have responded had I known. What if I had realized right after playing queen g6 that I could have just played queen takes h1? What if I had actually been colored by the emotional reality of, oh my gosh, I just missed a forced win in the second to last round of the world championship? This would have been a, um, a real test of my, of my stability. As it was, I was just involved in the struggle of the game. I played queen g6. So the game continued now, and you can see the tremendous struggle. I'll show you what happened now, because it's pretty interesting given the humor of that last moment. My opponent was so excited. He played king d2, defending his pawn, and he was back in it. Now I played queen f5. Now, this is a perfect example also of two players, after we had this tremendous connection and are both missing this obvious move, being entirely disconnected because he was involved in the reality that he had just been totally lost. He had given up the game completely, and now he was back in the fray. And I had all along been emotionally just playing chess. So at this point, because he saw a little more than I did, I wasn't so thrown off by a seesaw as he was. He played rook h4, preparing to play queen h2, hitting h5 and f4. I played rook g5. Now if he were to try queen h2, then after queen g6, I'm defending the h5 square well, planning rook g2 check. And if he tries queen takes f4, then rook g2 would lead to mate. If he goes to c1 or d1, I play queen takes c2 with check. And if he goes to e1, I play rook g1 check. Now after king f2 or e2 or d2, I would play queen g2 check. And now if he plays king d3, then after rook d1, king e3, queen d2 mate. And if he plays king e3, rook e1, king d3, queen e2 will be mate. So after rook g5, he saw that that was my idea, and he played king c1. Now I played queen g6, once again preparing rook g2. If he plays on f4, I would play rook g2 and win on the c2 square. It's hilarious that I have to go through all this, isn't it, when I had queen takes rook just ending the game right away? Here he played queen h2, so if rook g2, then rook takes h5 would be check. I played king g8, again planning rook g2. If he takes on f4 with the queen, even now after rook g2. It's his move, but there's no way to defend mate. So he's forced, in fact, to play queen d2. And then after rook g2, I mount the pressure. He goes to d3. Of course, if queen d1, then rook g1 would win the queen. After queen d3, now I'm back to my good technical play. Queen g5, attacking the rook, defending my pawn in f4. I have complete control of the g-file. His queen is kind of locked into the d3 square. And now I'm going to push my h-pawn. Rook h3, I played h4. He played king b2. Played rook g3, just nursing my h4 pawn ahead. Rook h2, h3. Of course, at this point, I knew I was winning, and I also thought that I had played a very good technical game, given that I was completely unaware of the tremendous oversight. He played c4, d takes c4, queen takes c4. He's just trying to come out of it somehow. Now I played queen f5, which is at once holding the e6 square, holding the h3 square, preparing rook g2, and attacking the f3 square. He played queen e2, defending as much as he can. Now I could have played queen g6, would have been strong preparing rook g2. But first I played the quiet move, king f7. And now he played queen e1. And then after rook g2, he resigned the game. I'm threatening c2. He has to take, and after I take back, there's no way for white to defend. My next couple moves will be queen h3 followed by queen h1 and forcing a queen, and black will lose. All I can say about this game is that afterwards I felt pretty good about it until people told me what I missed. And, um... It's interesting to think about how differently this game might have gone had I realized what I missed right after playing my move. And it's also interesting to think about what it was that allowed me to miss such an obvious move. And I believe that the answer to both questions, again, lies in the technique of coming back to the moment. If I had simply come back to the surface after making a very deep, deep, long think when I was deciding whether to trade queens or not, then I would have obviously seen queen takes rook and taken the rook. Also, if I had noticed what I had missed and I had been thrown off by it, the way to handle that will be simply to come back to the moment. Play the chess game that's on the board. This is often the answer to things. Just return to the immediate situation on the board. Don't think about the result. Don't think about anything. 
just play chess.